Thanks for joining us today. We are always encouraged to know that God is using this ministry to touch lives all across the world through what He's doing right here in Murfreesboro, Illinois. Please take a moment and share what God is doing in your life by sending an email to info at cccmurphy.com. We trust that you will be blessed by today's message. What I want to share with you this morning actually came from a, and I, I know this is going to seem strange, but uh, about a month ago, I was asked to do a funeral uh, for Mandy's father. And I, I checked with Mandy to find out if it would be all right if I could do this. But the Lord spoke something to me when I was in preparation for that funeral. And I really felt like it's the first time that I've ever felt like God wanted me to share a message with the congregation that I had shared at a funeral. But I, I want to do that today, if that's okay. <clears throat> I'm going to do it whether it's okay or not. <laughs> but the, uh, so I want to talk to you ab about this thought, what's in the middle makes the difference. Would you say that with me? What's in the middle makes the difference. I, I am a, I, I have to really guard myself against donuts. That's why there's a knife up here. <laughs> but uh, I love donuts. How many of you are donut lovers? Wave your hand if you're donut lovers, you know? And, and I just don't, you know, some folks just like the plain donuts. And I understand if it's just come fresh off the line, you know, and, and, and they melt in your mouth. And this probably isn't the thing I ought to be talking about during this fast. <laughs> if any of you that did not give up dessert for your fast, you, you're welcome to these when I get through with them. But the donuts that, that I always loved were the cr stuff that had something in the middle. <laughs> How many of you know it's what's in the middle that makes a difference? I mean, you know, I, I, loved, I, loved, I loved Bavarian cream filled donuts. I love, woo, somebody's getting with it over here today. I, I, love, I, I love pudding filled donuts, you know, I, I just, you know, jelly filled donut anything that as long as there's something in it but there is one i have a pet peeve and that is when i order a donut that's supposed to be cream filled and when i break it open i find out there's nothing in the middle has it that happened to anybody before does it doesn't that aggravate you I mean, you know, you've already got your, you've already got your mouth watering. Yeah, could I have some of that? I was going to lick my fingers, but I'm afraid that might break my fast. <laughs> I, 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 you've got your heart set on it, you know, and I, I, I've, I've been into those donuts before and just get a mouthful of dough. And that's all right if you're not expecting something in the middle, but for me, it's what's in the middle that makes a difference. And I thought, man, where is the, where's the filling at in this thing? And, you know, and, and you, get, you get all the way down to the end of it, and there you find a little bitty shot pocket where somebody squirted about a half inch of, you know, cream in there, and they called that a cream-filled donut. I wanted to talk to the manufacturer. Because I'm telling you, when, when I ask for a cream-filled donut... You don't know how bad I want to lick this right now. <laughs> it's what's in the middle that makes the difference. You remember the Susie Q's? How many, wave your hand if you remember Susie Q's. Those of you that don't missed out on a wonderful part of life. They were a hostess product and it was two chocolate cakes with cream filling in the middle. And that was when, now look, if, you cannot compare Susie Q's that they're making today because they taste like cardboard. I don't know where those things came from, but the Susie Q's when I was a kid, man, they were good. Somebody said they weren't good for you. I didn't care <laughs> when I was a kid whether it was good for It was good. And how many of you take your Susie Q, now be honest, and you take it and the first thing you did was... <laughs> You'd stick that tongue right in the center of that thing, man, and lick that cream filling out of there. And it was because it was what was in the middle that made the difference. I've gone through, I love, I can't believe I'm talking about, I love McDonald's hot apple pies. Are, you know, 
Have you, have you, man, there's nothing. I gave up sweets. I gave, I, I gave up desserts and I gave up coffee and I gave up meat. And the more I think about this, I probably just should have given up one. But, but, but I, so I, I love a hot cup of coffee with a McDonald's hot apple pie. Man, you bite. And I went through the one. I'll even tell No, I won't tell you where it was because somebody might be related to somebody that owns it. But I was, I went, I drove, I went through the drive through and I got this hot apple pie and I had that hot cup of coffee and I was about to enter heaven. I, I, I sat there and I, I took that thing and I, I got ready and I, I bit into it. It was dried out. I don't know how long that thing had set in that Passover. You know what I mean? That it needed to be passed over. But it, was, that, it, had, it had set in there long enough that there were no fresh apples in it. It was all dried up, man. It was like biting into a chunk of uh, crust. And, and I was so upset that I almost turned around and I went and, and I started to turn around and go back in that drive through and talk to them about their hot apple pies. I remembered I was a Christian and I decided not to. <laughs> but it's what's in the middle that makes a difference. How many of you guys used to eat cereal when you were kids? Let me talk to you about the way we picked our cereal. Because mom and dad would say, okay, now go pick out what cereal you want. We weren't looking for a certain type of cereal. We were searching the boxes to find out what prize was in the middle of the cereal. That's what determined whether we had shredded wheat or whether we had Fruit Loops. I could have cared less about, you know, the rabbit. I wanted to know about the prize that was in the center. We get home, <laughs> open up. You better hope that the prize was on top because if it wasn't, you weren't just going to be eating cereal. <laughs> you was going to be eating everything that was on my hand for the next month. Because I'd take my hand and shove it down in that cereal bag. <laughs> Where is that thing? I did that one time and found out that they put it inside the cardboard box. It wasn't even in the bag. I kept thinking I'd been ripped off. Because I was looking for what was in the middle. Because it's what, now you, you, you're looking at me and you're thinking, I can't believe this guy's silly. Let me tell you something, Cracker Jacks got a lawsuit thrown on them because they left something out of the middle of that box. That kid didn't buy that for the peanuts and the popcorn. He wanted the two cent toy that was inside that box. And when he didn't get it, he sued Cracker Jacks. You know what Cracker Jacks did? They gave him the toy. They gave him the two cent toy because <laughs> he was looking for what's in the middle because after all, it's what's in the middle that makes the difference. Amen. You remember freshen up gum? How many of you remember freshen up gum? Wave your hand at me if you remember freshen up. First time I bit into a piece of that gum, I thought somebody pulled a dirty trick on me. You remember freshen up? You, you, you bit into it and there was a pocket of, I really don't know what it was. I can tell you what I thought it was the first time I bit into it. And when I bit into it, it just burst in my mouth. But after I understood that it was supposed to be there, then I started wanting to buy Freshen Up because it was... What was in the middle that was so cool? I mean, what other piece of gum could you bite into and have something burst in your mouth? It's like a pocket of, yeah, freshness. Maybe that's why they called it freshen up. But it was, it was, it was just the, the middle part of that that I was looking for. And he said, well, what's all that got to do with anything? Did you ever walk through a cemetery? You know, when you look at a tombstone, it identifies your start time, 
your date of birth and it identifies your date of demise or when you left this world. But there's a little dash in between those two dates and that dash made all the difference because it's what's in the middle that makes the difference. Who cares about when you were born? Who cares about, can I, do you understand? I celebrate a birthday every year. But throughout my life, I've never, I've never sat down and really contemplated the day I came into this world. I never sat down and tried to figure out what I was thinking when the doctor slapped me. I never thought about what was going on in my mind, you know, at that point. And, and I haven't reached the end point, so I've got no clue what's going to go through my mind. But it's the middle part that makes the difference. Amen. What's the point if you live to be 100 years old and you waste 99 of those years? It's the middle that makes the difference. Everybody say the middle makes the difference. When I thought about that, I thought about, well, what happens when the only thing you have in the middle is a mess? How many of you have ever had a mess in the middle? Your mom ever walk in on you in the kitchen and you decided you was going to cook something? And she walks in in the middle of your project. And I don't know why it takes three bowls to scramble one egg. <laughs> but you've got, you, you've got a mess going on in the middle of that thing. And you get trapped in the mess. And if you're not careful, you never see it out. You never see your way out of the mess. I thought about a lady in scripture, doesn't even give her name, doesn't tell you when she was born, it doesn't tell you the day of her decease. As a matter of fact, the only thing that it talks about concerning her is what she got caught in the middle of. She got caught in the act of adultery, right in the middle of the act. And the, the mess that was in the middle of what she was going through was getting ready to destroy her life because the people that caught her led her from that place to a public place of execution. They marched her out in the middle of a street where they were going to stone her. You know what the only difference was for her? Is somebody showed up in the middle of her mess <laughs> and his name is Jesus and it's what's in the middle that made the difference when Jesus showed up in the middle as a matter of fact in the gospel it says that he was in the middle of the street with her and he looked at her and when everybody was ready to take her out and take her down he stepped up in the middle of her mess and said he that's without sin let him cast the first stone and all of a sudden in the middle of it God's not interested in how good you've been or how bad you've been he just wants to get in the middle of your life and help you navigate it and help see you through to the end cause it's what's in the middle that makes the difference. Amen. And so he showed up in the middle. And those guys started dropping rocks. And they took off. And she looked up. And he looked at her and he said, woman, where are your accusers? Let me say it to you this way. He's saying, woman, what happened to the mess you were in a minute ago? You see, we're ready to give up. We're ready to throw on the towel. We're ready to quit. And God's saying, all I want you to do is invite me in the middle of your mess. And I can make a difference for you. Where, where is 
that situation that was going to take you out. And she looked up and she said, it's gone. (laughs) Where are your accusers at? And she said, Lord, I, I don't have any. And what did he say to her? He said, neither do I condemn you. He didn't come into this world to condemn the world. He came to save the world. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What's he saying? Don't get yourself in this mess again. I was, I don't know if any of you, how many of you know where Goreville is? Have you ever heard of Goreville? Wave your hand. Outside of Goreville, if you head outside of Goreville, I don't even know the road that it leads. All I know is it was, I've always known it as the Goreville Blacktop. Twin Hills, you know where I'm talking about? It comes off, you get off of 57 at certain exit and you go down these Twin Hills. And years ago, not too long ago, I was 16, 17 years old. It's five, six, seven, maybe 10. <laughs> I was, I, I was coming back from a church service, snow, man, it had, it had snowed to beat the band that year. And all, those rows were snow packed, snow covered. And I was, I'd come over the top of one of those twin hills and I had my brother in the car with me. And as I came over the top of that twin hill, I was right in the middle of going down it. Everybody say in the middle of it. And for some reason in my mind, I thought it would be a good idea to drop the car down in low. I figured that out, George. (laughs) See, what I should have done was I should have put the car in low before I got in the middle of it. I should have slowed down before I hit it over the top of that hill. But it didn't occur to me until I was right in the middle of it. How many of you have ever had that happen to you before? I mean, you know, you pull some boneheaded idea right in the middle of something, and and man, I'm telling you, I don't know what I was thinking. I reached down, and I pulled that car in low, and it didn't take but a nanosecond for me to figure out that wasn't the thing to have done. The back wheels of that car grabbed, I started fishtailing going down those twin hills. Now, if you've ever been down those twin hills, you know, I don't know now, it's been a long time since I've been down there, but there were no guardrails that that protected them all the way down. And there were places that if you went off that hill, you're going to drop 30 feet. I'm cutting that car. We're, we're, We're sliding. My brother Paul's in the car with me and he yelled, Rick, we're sliding. Like I needed him to tell me that. I got what I'm thinking, man, I know we're sliding you. I'm cutting the wheels trying to get it straight. Now, I am in the middle of disaster. Now, I'm not playing, guys. I mean, I'm, in the, I'm getting ready to go off a 30-foot drop, and I'm going to roll this car down that gully. And nothing I'm doing is helping. And the only thing... We knew to do was say, Jesus, Jesus. And about the time I, I said Jesus or Paul said Jesus, I think we probably were in harmony at that point. God is my witness. My brother weighed over 300 pounds and he come flying across the seat at me. I'm, I'm telling you the truth to this day. I believe God grabbed him and threw him at me. I'm just telling you the truth because, see, I had a hold of the wheel and everything I was doing was failing. I couldn't straighten myself up. You can't fix yourself. You can't straighten yourself up. You can't deliver yourself in the middle of a mess. And I cried out, Jesus. And man, I promise you, Paul come flying across the car, hit me, knocked my hands off the wheel, smashed me up against the car door, and that car starts going. All I see is snow over the windshield. I didn't know if we were airborne. I'm just being honest, man. I didn't know what happened. All of a sudden, it go, and stopped. 
when I opened the car door and got out, half of the car was hanging over the edge of the drop like that. The only thing that had that car still on the road was the weight of the engine. The back wheels were spinning in air. And I realized that God showed up in the middle of my mess. Amen. Amen. And it was what is in the middle that makes the difference. You ever been there? You ever needed him to show up? There are a couple guys I remember hearing about. And man, these guys were... You know what I'm talking about, how we identify, oh, you're a loser. They'd gotten, their whole life had been spent doing what was wrong, and they finally got caught doing it, and they got sentenced to death. There's nothing that they're proud about. Nothing that they've ever done that's going to make family want to write a book about them and their exploits. They're just in a mess. They're going to be ridiculed in front of a crowd of people. And the only hope they have is what's in the middle of them. Because the scripture said that those two thieves were being crucified. And Jesus was in the middle. And it's what's in the middle that makes the difference. One looked at him and began to ridicule him and say, if you're the son of God, why don't you save yourself and save us? He's dying. He's not repentant. He's dying. And heaven is an arm's reach away. And he's not reaching. The other guy knows that he's in a mess. And he looks at the man in the middle and he hollered back at the other guy and he said, man, what's wrong with you? He said, we deserve to be here. He said, he hasn't done anything worthy to be put where he's at. But here he is in the middle. And he looked at him and he said, would you remember me? And in that moment, through all his pain, he pushed it back. He pushed back his suffering. And in that moment of time, he didn't focus on himself. He focused on them. And the man in the middle made the difference. <laughs> It's easy to believe in a God that's seated on the right hand of power. It's easy to believe in a God that's raising the dead and opening blind eyes. But when you see him dying on a cross, when you see Jesus struggling to breathe, and not walking on water, when you see blood flowing from his body like a river. When you see a face that is so bruised and so beaten that people couldn't recognize him. What would it cause you to reach for him? It's because... The thief understood there's more to him than I can see. Amen. There's more to your life than what you're going through. There's more to your dream than the disappointment. There's more hope than you're experiencing right now. Amen. But it can only be found 
when you invite him into the middle of your circumstance. Mandy's father's name was Stanton Carroll. Called her up. I said, Mandy, I said, what? What's your dad's middle name? Said he doesn't have one. He, he doesn't have a middle name. No, they, they never gave him one. It's, he's never had a middle name. I was praying about God. What, I didn't know him. I called Mandy. And I said, Mandy, I said, could you share some memories with me about your father? Now, I asked her for permission to say this, so don't anybody get beside yourself. I said, could you, could you share some memories with me about your dad? And she looked at me and she said, Pastor, I, I really don't have any. Said my dad was an alcoholic. Divorced my mom, he used to beat my mom, said he divorced her when I was five. I just don't have any memories. I talked to her stepmom and I could hear the struggle in her stepmom's voice to try and grab hold of a memory. She said, well, we used to go for a drive out in the country and and we, he, one time he held a baby for me while I was, and I could hear it. I hung up the phone and they called back later and I said, we thought of something. She, she thought of something, called back later, she thought of something. And so she told me that and then I got on the phone with Mandy again and Mandy was kind of laughing a little bit and she said, then her stepmom said, you know, said, there just wasn't a lot of, you know, and, and this is what she said. She said, he said, you know, he was kind of a jerk. I hung up the phone and I thought, God, there, there's no memories. There's no, what am I going to speak? There's no, and then it hit me. There's no middle in his life. No middle name. No middle. And what's in the middle makes the difference. But then I heard something about Stanton. Stanton had been a rascal, man, his whole life. But Stanton was dying with cancer. Let me say it to you this way. Stanton was in the middle of a storm Amen. that he'd never been in before. And he couldn't get himself out of the storm. And it was in the middle of the storm Amen. that he found the man in the middle. Amen. In the middle of that storm, when he lay in a hospital bed and the prognosis had been given and there was no hope and, and a minister came walking by and right there in the middle of his storm, Stanton said, Lord, I need you. Will you come into my heart? He found him in the middle. I'm here to share with you today uh, that it doesn't matter what you're going through. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're facing. Uh, it doesn't matter what the affliction, what the persecution, what the feeling. Uh, he's there in the middle of it if you let him be. All you've got to do is ask him. Jack, I went and prayed for Jack a couple months ago, however long it's been now. When I went into the room and I prayed for him, I knew that if God didn't show up in the middle of this thing, Jack wasn't going to be with us. Amen. And Jack, I don't know if he really knew, if he really understood it, but do you understand? You don't give up in the middle. 
You don't take a look at someone and say, well, there ain't no need to pray for him. He's just beyond hell. You don't do that. What you do is you quit looking at your own ability and you start looking at the one that spoke this world into existence. You start looking at the one that's able to speak light where there's darkness, to speak life where there's death, to speak hope where there's depression. He is the man in the middle. He's the one that's able to make the difference if you let him. Somebody say, you, you have to let him. You can't just walk away from it. It's Psalms 119 and 62. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. At midnight. What is midnight? It's the middle of the night. In the middle of the night, I'm going to get up and thank you. In the middle of my night, I'm going to give you praise. In the middle of my night, I'm going to reach for you because I know it's what's in the middle that makes the difference. I'm not going to fall into despair. I'm not going to abandon ship. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to say, Jesus! Because it's what's in the middle that makes the difference. It's what Jesus is trying to explain. In the book of St. John, the 16th chapter, Jesus is telling us what happens when you let him in the middle of your storm, when you let him in the middle of your night. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace Amen. you're not going to get through life without having a midnight you're not going to get through life without a struggle but he said i've told you these things so that in me you can have perfect peace in the world you have tribulation and distress and suffering but be courageous be confident be undaunted. Be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished. My victory is abiding. What's he saying? I can make a difference. Amen. Would you stand with me? I can make a difference. But you've got to let him. You have to be willing to say, here I am, God. Sometimes we let pride get in the way. I thought about it. The, our friends that were with us last week. Remember, David, the guy that pulled the 747, I was talking to him after church. I took him out to dinner and I was looking at his hand. And I saw black marks on his hand. And I looked at him, I said, how's your hand feeling after breaking that hammer? And he looked at me and he said, you know what? He said, that hammer is the hardest thing I have to do up there on stage. Didn't look very big. Thought a big guy like you and letting some little hammer give you a problem like that? I didn't tell him that. <laughs> See, it's little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little things. And we don't give him the little things, they become big things. 
I know what it's like to lose a dad. I know what it's like to feel like God forgot all about me. To feel like God didn't care. I know what it's like to look it into heaven and say, how could you let this happen? There's situations that you go through in your lives and sometimes it may be financial, sometimes it may be physical, sometimes it's just emotional. Sometimes it's a combination of it all, man. It just feels like the sky is falling. How could you let this happen? And then all of a sudden, God started talking to me. Not in a verbal voice, but in my heart. And he reminded me, he said, you know what? You ask me to save your father. could have given him to you for another 15 years and you would have lost him forever but it was in the middle of my dad's turmoil Amen. that he asked Jesus into his heart Amen. and what's in the middle makes the difference You don't have to live depressed. You don't have to face life alone. God never intended for your, to li for your life to be just filled with depression. What did he say? He, he tells us in John 33. He says, be confident, be undaunted, be filled with joy. I've overcome the world. I showed up in the middle of your mess and I conquered it. <laughs> I've overcome the world. The Bible said that he was tempted in all like manner as we were. You don't have a market on temptation. Uh, Jesus already faced it uh, and he defeated it. He said, I've overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished. My victory is abiding. What's he saying? Hey, this is what, would you come up here just a second real quick? Let me borrow you. This is what he's saying. He's saying, come here. He's saying, you may be struggling. You may have stuff going on in your heart that you don't want to tell anybody else about. But that's not making it go away. You may try and navigate life all alone because somehow, somewhere, somebody told you that's what men do. Somebody lied to you. Real men turn to Jesus. And so, what he's saying, he's saying, look, man, be courageous. Be confident. Be, be filled with joy. What's he, I've overcome the world. What's he saying? He's saying, man, come walk with me. Be my friend. Let me be your friend. You don't have to navigate this life alone. I want to be your best friend. The scripture said that there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Now, I know it took a lot of courage for him just to get up here. He had no clue I was going to do this to him, and he may sit in the back the next time he comes. <laughs> but what I'm saying is this, is at some point in our lives, we all have to step out. At some point, we all have to say, here I am, God. Amen. Why not do it right now? Thank you. Amen. So this is, this is what I'm asking you to do today I want everyone that's in this building you know when you let Jesus into the middle of your night he'll give you a brand new day <laughs> yes he will he'll give you 
a brand new day. So I want to invite you to ask God to step into the middle of it with you. Whether it's sickness or depression or financial, whether it's bitter circumstance, whatever it is, just ask him to step in it with you. You say, well, Pastor, he, he wouldn't want me now. I want to end with this. In the book of Matthew, the 20th chapter. You know, I get, I, I've had people tell me, God can't save me. My standard reply to that is, don't tell God what he can and what he can't do. God's more than able to save you. He's more than able to show up. And you, you're, I'm not, I, I am not diminishing what you're going through, but hear me. Your circumstance, you may not be any match for your circumstance, but your circumstance is no match for God. So it comes down to whether I keep trying to handle it myself or whether I give it to him. Book of Matthew, parables given, the 20th chapter of Matthew, and it's about this guy, and it says that this landowner, he, he went out and he was looking for people to work in his field. He went out real early, probably like five, six in the morning, and he found some guys that would work in his field, and they agreed on the price. It was just an average day's wage, and they all agreed to it, and, and they all went into the field working. Well, while they're working, he goes back into the market and he sees some more guys standing around. It's nine o'clock in the morning. He said, what are y'all doing standing here? He said, well, we don't have a job. He said, well, go in my vineyard. He said, I'll do what's right. I'll, I'll do whatever's right with you. Go in my vineyard and work. So they go. He goes back into town at noon and finds some more people. He goes back in at three o'clock and finds some more people. All of them standing around. He said, go, go work in my vineyard. What are you doing hanging out here? Then he goes in at five o'clock. He finds some guys out there and he said, what are you doing here? And listen to their reply. It's not because they're lazy. It's not because they don't want to work. They looked at him and said, no one's asked us. Look, buddy, I know what it is to need a job and want a job and not be able to find a job. When I was a young man just out of college, I, I looked everywhere trying to find a job. I went to college and ended up hanging sheetrock. And I was thrilled to do it because it was a job. I didn't look at the guy that said, I'll put you to work for me and say, oh no, that's not my degree. I didn't look at the guy and say, no, I'm not gonna work for you because that's not enough money. Because when you got zero coming in, anything is more than you got. I was thankful that somebody finally said, I'll hire you. You can work for me. I went to work for that guy and within like, I think it was within two or three months, they had me doing wallpaper. The other workers were getting aggravated. They said, man, he, what, are you, what are you doing doing this? I said, I'm doing what he asked me to do. He told me to do this. And they're getting upset. And one of the guys came up to me and he whispered in my ear. And he said, look, the reason they're mad is because they've been wanting to do this for a long time. He said, he's grooming you for something. He's getting you ready for something. So I went on doing what he asked me to do until somebody else came by and gave me a better field to work in. Amen. I want you to hear me. Because <laughs> a lot of you didn't have any problem cutting up and showing out. <laughs> a lot of you didn't have any problem in the old field you were in. But today I'm telling you, you've got a better offer. <laughs> I'm letting you know that there's a better field for you to work in say well will he treat me right well let's take a look at the parable at the end of the day the day's end came and so he brings the guys in that had been in the field for an hour 
work for an hour and he paid them a full day's wage. <laughs> the guys came, they went to work at three, they got a full day's wage. At noon, got a full day's wage. At nine, got a full day's wage. And when the guys came that had been there since five or six in the morning and he gave them a full day's wage, they got mad. Hey, this ain't right. We ought to get more than they did. He said, wait a minute. He said, didn't you agree with me at the beginning of this day that you would work for this amount? He said, I haven't done you any wrong. Are you upset with me because I'm generous with what is mine to give? <laughs> he wasn't cutting in on their wages. He was just showing mercy to some folks that nobody wanted. How about it? Are you ready? I want you on three, I want you just to move out of your seat, come down here with whatever it is that you need him to get in the middle of. Whatever it is that you need, it may be healing for your body. He said, I'm the Lord thy God that healeth thee. It may be your finances. If you're faithful with what you've got, then you can put a demand on God. He said, try me and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven for you and pour out blessing that you can't contain. If it's family or if it's emotional, God will get in the middle of it when you ask him to. Are you ready to ask him right now? Go ahead and sing it. As they're singing it, would you stretch your hands to heaven with me right now? You're in this place and you're ready. You're saying, God, I, I need you in the middle. I want you to move right now. One, two, three. We hope you've been touched by today's message. I wanted to take a moment and just remind you how very much God loves you. The Apostle Peter tells us that it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In the book of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, God speaks through the prophet and tells us that I know what my plans are for you, that they're plans for good and not for destruction, to give you a future and a hope. That's what God wants for your life. He has a plan and a purpose designed specifically for you. And you can walk into that plan and purpose by just asking him in your heart today. I wonder if you'd take a moment right now and just stop wherever you're at and pray this prayer with me. God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. Lord, I believe that Jesus was crucified on my behalf, that you raised him from the dead so that I could have life. And right now, I accept you as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, we believe that angels are rejoicing in heaven because you've come home. Now the important thing is for you to find a good Bible-believing church and become a part of that as you continue your journey with Jesus. We want to invite you to come and be with us any chance you get. Until then, remember, Jesus loves you and we do too.